breaking news right now. Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb addressing Hoosiers on the state's actions in response to the coronavirus crisis. Let's listen in. You're on deck and uh, you want to give some of the latest numbers on the ground. Switch from basketball to baseball. Basketball to baseball. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, Hoosiers. Today we reported 394 new cases with 31, unfortunately, additional deaths here in the state of Indiana. Both of these numbers may be lower than what actually occurred because our system connectivity issues continued through the early part of the day yesterday, so it took a while for the reporting to come through. That has com been completely resolved as of this point in time. These numbers uh, bring to 12,438 the number of Hoosiers known to have COVID-19 and the total number of individuals who have died to 661. As you can see by the uh, slides that we're showing, we continue to have about 46% of our ICU beds that are available and that has been very consistent along with about 77% of our ventilators. Yesterday, I provided updated numbers regarding long-term care facilities. We did receive some additional questions afterwards, so I wanted to provide additional clarification. Of the 1,568 long-term care facilities, uh, cases in long-term care facilities, I announced 993 involve residents and 575 were staff. We're working with our data team to make these aggregate numbers available on our dashboard on a weekly basis, and you should see that soon. As I mentioned earlier this week, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has announced it will be issuing new requirements that facilities notify residents and their representatives about conditions inside the facility, such as when new cases of COVID-19 occur or if any changes occur. This is something that ISDH supports completely. The CDC recommends that a person be assigned responsibility for communications with staff and with residents and with their families. Having one voice that speaks for that facility helps ensure the delivery of timely and very accurate information. We have shared that guidelines with all licensed long-term care facilities across the state. We're also working with the Division of Aging Ombudsman at FSSA to create guidance for long-term care facilities to follow regarding these communications. I expect to have more information to share about this partnership next week. Finally, I want to give a shout out to everyone who continues to review the data coming in and provides, uh, and provides updates that you would like to see on the dashboard. This helps to increase visibility and transparency. We'll continue to gather analyze and refine information as it becomes available to give Hoosiers the best picture that we can of COVID-19 across our state. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Box. And uh, next up, we've got uh, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch. You've been, partner, you've been all over the state of Indiana uh, remotely I can, uh, from your office, uh, but you've been dealing a lot with um, in the ag world and tourism world and okra, the Office of Community and Rural Affairs, um, et cetera. You want to give us an update. You've got a lot of information that's been stored up. So you want to do a, a data dump uh, right now for folks across the state of Indiana? Thank you, Governor Holcomb, yeah. for this opportunity to provide Hoosiers with updates on the agencies that I head up as Lieutenant Governor, housing, tourism, agriculture, broadband, and the Office of Community Rural Affairs, or OPRA. In these uncertain times, housing stability has never been more important for our Hoosier families. And the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority recently released a resource guide to help support Hoosier homeowners and renters. And this guide will help them navigate crucial conversation with their lenders and their landowners. And these are conversations, Governor, that they need to have right now. But in addition, we have also reopened Indiana's hardest hit fund, up to $30 million available for mortgage payment assistance. Qualified Hoosier homeowners struggling to pay their mortgage can apply to receive up to six months of monthly mortgage payment assistance. And they can call 877-GET-HOPE or go to 877-GET-HOPE Org. The tourism industry is taking a hard economic hit due to the pandemic, and our Indiana Office of Tourism is partnering with Rockport Analytics to research and determine the true economic impact 
of COVID-19 on this sector. And they will provide an Indiana specific index that will assist our statewide partners in their recovery planning. Uncertainty is not new for our farmers and they are charging ahead into the planting season. 4% of our corn, 2% of our soybeans are already in the ground, which is slightly ahead of our five year average. And we will continue to ramp up in the weeks and months ahead. Our economic development team has worked hand in hand with agribusiness and producers to help them understand the SBA loan and financial resources available to them. Indiana Grown has been connecting farmers with produce to different sales opportunities like food banks and pantries. And they have also partnered directly with Indiana Grown restaurants and are helping them adjust their business models to meet social distancing recommendation. But Governor, you know connectivity is so vital, especially now, as we are all working and learning from home. And you and I remain committed to providing fast, affordable, reliable broadband to all Hoosiers in all areas of our state. And through the Next Level Connections program, we are investing $100 million to connect Hoosiers to each other, to the nation, and to the world. We have already awarded over 28 million to connect over 11,000 households in 18 counties. And we are currently in the middle of round two with $70 million available funding. Those applications are due on May 26. We know that our main streets are struggling in our small and rural communities, and we are working to help ease their burden. Earlier this month, the Office of Community and Rural Affairs, or OCRA, launched a COVID-19 response program, and it repurposed four and a half million dollars of community development block grant funds to help our small and new rural communities respond to this crisis. And so today I am pleased to announce the first recipients of that grant program. We have 13 communities, totaling almost $2 million in grant funding. We are awarding money to the towns of Barkersville, Hebron, La Crosse, North Manchester, the cities of Delphi, Greensburg, Knox, Logansport, and the counties of Cass, Fulton, Noble, Pike, and Tippecanoe. And these funds will be used for testing and diagnostic services, meal and supply delivery, and to provide capital to small businesses for job retention. We will have more recipients to announce in the weeks ahead and we expect more funding for the federal government through the CARES Act. So Governor, I look forward to giving more updates in the future. And in closing, I wanna thank you for the great honor of serving with you. Uh, and <laughs> I know that as Hoosiers, we are all in this together. We thank you for your leadership and we look forward to recovering together. So thank you and God bless you. Yeah, you as well. I'm looking forward to being back together in the same room, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, also, just to dovetail on what the Lieutenant Governor just talked about, I mean, every day uh, I'm reminded by these uh, very overt or um, out in the open acts of generosity, and that's a long list. Uh, we literally could fill a whole hour with that every single day with new examples. Um, but there's another list that is forming up that if you read clips as much as we do all over the state of Indiana, there's an anonymous list as well of folks that are just doing the right thing um, when no one's watching or they don't want the spotlight on them. They just want to make a difference. And there's one such anonymous um, uh, local business in Fortville, Indiana, that that uh, paid everyone's uh, water and sewer bills over $200,000, just did it for the whole community, and said, "We'll worry about this in a couple months, but until then, don't worry about it." And when you see folks like that that are stepping up, it just it, it like I always say, just fuels um, everyone's uh, work ethic around here to want to do more. And then you've got this, again, this list that continues just to form up. Um, too big for a scroll at this point, but Main Street, Shelbyville, Inc. Um, has partnered with local community groups and they've set up a, a fairly unique, uh, although it's cropping up around the state of Indiana, a fairly unique approach uh, in terms of 
paying for all the advice and counsel when small businesses are applying for um, various SBA loan programs or grant programs. And so every penny that's awarded to one of these businesses is actually going right back into that business and not, they're not having to um, pay for or hire uh, consultants along the way. And that's, that just means time and money are not being wasted. Um, and so just salute uh, the folks in Shelbyville for coming up with that arrangement. And then um, up and over from where we are right now, uh, the Western Boone's FFA program has created a new program. It's called um, Milk and Meat uh, Boone County, two, two sources of nourishment that are near and dear to my heart. Um, but that, that program, they're raising money to buy milk and meat, then to supply the local food pantries. And so you talk about folks stepping up, again, of all ages and all stripes and all backgrounds, addressing a central need in that community. And it's just exactly what um, Lieutenant Governor Krauss just mentioned, how these communities, whether they're rural, urban, or suburban, as she just articulated, um, coming together to focus on the, the need of the day. So thank you to all those that I just mentioned. And Rachel, I'm assuming you've got that look like you've got some questions teed up. We'll begin with Sherry from the Indianapolis Star. Good afternoon, Sherry. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question. Um, this is a question for Dr. Box. Dr. Box, a couple of days ago, you talked about how you were um, trying to expand and increase testing. And I know you're doing drive-through clinics. At this stage, are you encouraging doctors to think about testing anyone with potential symptoms, regardless of risk, regardless of age? And if not now, at what point do you see that happening and is that a critical piece of trying to expand testing and getting to the point? Uh, yeah. So Sherry, I think that's a great question and I think that's an important next step for us, right? Is that in order for us at the State Department of Health and for our local health departments to know that there is somebody who's positive and that we need to do contact tracing, we need to investigate that individual, talk to them about anybody they may have been in close contact with, and then follow up with those contacts and make sure that people are isolating or quarantining, we have to have tests. So I would agree that at this point in time, my ask is for physicians and healthcare providers across the state to be able to test individuals that are sick, that they feel could be sick with COVID-19. And they don't have to have a lot of underlying conditions conditions and they don't have to work in a long-term care facility. The problem may be for them is that we are in the process of making sure that there is access to that particular site where an individual can go and get tested because it is something that does still require usually a nasopharyngeal swab which usually requires the personal protective equipment to be able to do that testing and making sure that they actually have the swabs and the viral transport media to do that. So that may be a barrier to some of them and we are working to make sure that we identify those gaps and those barriers and remove those to the best of our ability. And, and, and by the way, uh, pardon me, Rachel, um, the, the Lieutenant Governor is with us for the whole hour. So she, she you know, gave some shout outs all over the state of Indiana. So there may be some local media questions you know, directed at uh, her as well. Steve with KPC Media. Good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon, how are you doing today? Doing great, thank you, how are you? Pretty good. Uh, actually, just building off the, the last question a little bit um, regarding testing, I know as, as we advance here and, and the goal is, as we look toward reopening Indiana will be to have that ability to respond quickly to new infections, kind of, I think of it almost in the way that we handle with long-term care facilities where we're going to swarm in and, and try to identify as, as much as possible and, and respond that way. My question is, in when we get to that point, if you know, say in my office, somebody is um, sick or test positive with COVID-19, is, is the goal to eventually also be able to test other non-symptomatic people around them? And, and with that, and talking with our health uh, officer here in the county, is there accuracy concerns when you're testing people who aren't um, necessarily seriously symptomatic? 
That's a, that's a really good question. Um, there have been several studies out to show that when you test asymptomatic individuals, if you don't use a true nasopharyngeal swab to get the sample, that your ability to pick that disease up, if it's there and they're asymptomatic, is very low. Even individuals who are just in the first couple days of their symptom, if we just do a lower nose or what we call anterior nares swab, it may be positive when that individual truly has COVID-19 about 40% of the time. So it is critical that we are testing to the best of our abilities with the appropriate swab. Now that being said, when we have things like point of care testing, oftentimes that's an anterior nares lower nose um, swab, and we will be doing the best we can to identify everybody that's positive, but it is going to be critical as we move forward to be able to identify and to trace all these cases back to the best of our ability so that we can let people know when they're sick that they need to isolate and this is what isolation looks like. And if they've been exposed, they need to stay home and quarantine and call us for symptoms so that at the first sign of symptoms, if we need to, we can test them. Yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, Steve, the whole process, just to boil it down, that's part of the you know, what the first quarter that we were in, now we're in the second quarter where we're, we're going from, you know, the mitigation and we still need to take all the necessary steps to mitigate, to flatten the curve, slow the spread. And then you go into the, obviously, as we continue to expand our testing, then to tracing, then to isolation. And that will enable us, if we get that right, um, ongoing for as long as it takes, just to be realistic about this, um, that will enable more of us to get back to work in a safe environment. Sierra, Wish TV. Good afternoon, Sierra. Hi, good afternoon. So my question was more so um, looking back, Dr. Box, I know you mentioned yesterday that we were going to see those death toll numbers start to jump because we would start counting all the people who had the underlying COVID um, symptoms. I was wondering, if you know, we've spoken to someone who was sick back in December before we even knew that COVID was in the United States, um, and he had gotten a call in March that it was likely that he had COVID back when he was in the hospital in December. So um, I'm wondering, what do you think? You know, is there actually going to be a good number to represent how many people actually died from COVID, or how many people actually had COVID? Um, you know, since it was obviously in the United States before we kind of started really tracking it closely in late February um, and early March? It's an excellent question, and I think that we're going to do our absolute very best to identify absolutely every death that we think was associated with COVID-19 and make sure that we appropriately um, count that number. There will be individuals that never hit the hospital system that may very well have had COVID-19, and they won't know that until we have that good antibody test out there to show that they are immune. And then we'll know, yep, that bad upper respiratory or lower respiratory infection you had in late February or mid-February probably was COVID-19. Um, there are other individuals that were in the hospital that may have been discharged with the diagnosis of COVID-19, and that's what we're in the process of trying to make sure that we know all of those individuals in addition to those deaths because if we only report on the other suspected COVID-19 or or presumed COVID-19 deaths as other states are but we don't have that underlying number of other people that were sick but didn't die from it it's going to really inflate the the death rate number for the state and sorry I have a quick follow-up to that do you guys know how much earlier COVID um, might have been in the United States before I think we had, um, you know, mm -hmm. our first death was reported around March 15th. So do, have you guys been able to track how much earlier yeah, we might have actually been dealing with this before we knew it? We, we tra tracked cases that we thought probably went back to at least mid-February, but I heard earlier that um, California may have traced it back to early February even, so, or late January. Alexandra, the Gary Post Tribune. Good afternoon, Alexandra. Good afternoon, do you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Crystal clear. Awesome. <laughs> so my question uh, will probably be more for Dr. Box. Um, I've been curious about strike teams. And uh, as a follow-up to a question that I asked uh, yesterday, I was curious who makes up 
the strike teams, like who, what type of professionals or, you know, who's on the teams. And if uh, jails are treated the same way as other long-term facilities, or if maybe they have a different protocol of some kind. Yeah, so we, we do treat jails exactly the same way. It's a congregate living setting. We go in when we're called exactly the same way we, we would for a long-term care facility, go back and follow up and do additional testing, do education about um, cohorting individuals, um, separating them out, making sure we do the infection control um, discussion and make sure that that's all in place, PPE is in place. But I'm gonna let Dr. Dan, who's here with us, talk a little bit about the makeup of that team. So thanks. Uh, if you look at our strike teams, they really consist of a group of individuals with different backgrounds. So there's typically the coordinator, and as we all know, that's probably the most important role, and that's the person who looks through that email list or um, every morning and as they come in throughout the day and identifies the places that are asking for us to come. And then we have folks who drive, and so as we have mentioned, we have a strike team in every preparedness district plus an additional strike team for cases that come up during the day while the other teams are out. And so there'll be somebody who will drive on that strike team. Uh, often we have a nurse surveyor that either meets them there or goes with them, and then we have epi and infection control support. So the teams will go there, they'll uh, have their own PPE, they'll identify the residents within the facility that require testing, do that immediate uh, testing, and then are able to get those results back to our lab, which is waiting uh, so that we can turn around those results really quickly. Uh, in addition, we'll have additional teams that once we know there's an outbreak beginning in a long-term care facility, that can go and work with that facility to make sure that we get the additional residents and staff that are uh, needed to be tested because they were either in the same hall or same area around there. So the strike team has lots of different members and then in addition we have a additional components of the strike team which I mentioned include nurse surveyors and uh, infection control that will follow up often daily with those facilities to make sure that things are going okay, the plans in place to identify new cases and look at uh, opportunities for new uh, ways to help mitigate the spread. Adam Wren, Indianapolis Monthly. Afternoon Adam. Afternoon, thank you for taking my question. Um, Dr. Box, you had mentioned on April 6th that uh, in a few weeks we would have the capacity to test 6,300 Hoosiers a day. Um, are we making progress to that goal? And wh what date do you expect us to be able to expand the capacity to that, to that number? So we, from the standpoint of having labs and systems that are ready and willing to do the testing, we have that. Now the question is, do all the places that are open and available to test for individuals, are they accessible? Do we have them all over the state? And do they have the swabs and the viral transport media that they need to do that testing? So we have the ability to run the test. We need to now make sure we've got the ability to, to take the test. We are going to start working with our labs already. Several across the state have validated a different way of doing this testing with their machines, meaning that if we know we have 10 COVID positive vials here, that they can use a, a different type of swab, like a routine Q-tip in saline and actually do that same test and that we can have that show positive. And if we can validate that with labs across the state, as some have already done, that will open up the ability to test much wider with that anterior nares or lower nose um, specimen that I was talking about. Kathy Tretter, Ferdinand News. Good afternoon. Thanks for being with us. Good afternoon. I'd like to make a comment before I ask a question, and that is, I'd like to mention that we media people, we're kind of essential too. We're trying to get that information you, out there. Yep. But nobody ever says we're essential, and I just wanted to make that comment first. But, um, and Dr. Box, my question is for you, and it kind of follows up to a question I think that was asked Monday um, by an NPR station, and that is uh, in Spencer County, they are doing a, a finger prick test that is showing more COVID-19 cases than is listed on the, the um, monitor. Uh, for example, they, have, they had nine the other day and there's only still five on the monitor. Um, it, they explained to me that it is a, it is a company, an in United States company that provided the test and the testing is 
rather rapid. It doesn't show if you're just in the first stages, but it shows if you have it or if you have had it. Is that valid? I, you know, we, we wrote about it, and I want to make sure we're, we're saying something valid out there. I'm sorry, but I have absolutely no medical information or documentation about that test and its validity or how it's even uh, testing. So I, I, I cannot further enlighten you, you on that. And Kathy, I would just um, say, and I will do it again and I'll do it every day, that um, I actually have um, praised the fourth estate for getting out the information, whether it be radio, print, on air, social media. Um, I think in the state of Indiana, I can't speak for other states, although um, we just did, I just got off a call with, um, with the National Governors Association and we counted it was our 16th conference call um, to date. So we're all talking about the same issues, testing and tracing and where we are, cases versus hospitalizations, et cetera. Um, but I, I just want to say thank you to the press corps in general for helping us get this information out. That's our whole goal is to try to be as transparent as we can, put the facts out there on the table, tell the truth, uh, and we can respond to uh, the facts as they are on the ground. And the more uh, buy-in we have across the state of Indiana when folks are looking at the same facts, uh, the quicker we'll get there. So your job is not just essential, I would say underscore twice, critical to the mission that we're all in, and we all are in this together. Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Brandon, let me praise you next. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Go ahead. I appreciate it, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this is a question for you or for Dr. Box, possibly. Uh, Wayne County is saying that they have been ordered by the State Department of Health's Food Protection Division that they can no longer prevent uh, restaurants from keeping their lobbies closed, like in a McDonald's, even for carryout, which Wayne County had been doing. So why are you restricting local health departments from kind of clamping down a little further while still keeping restaurants open? Um, I don't have an answer first for that. I that. I, I, that is the first time I've heard anything about that. I can certainly check into that. Um, normally when a local health department or uh, the local uh, officials are in disagreement with something that the State Department of Health has recommended or done, I'm the first to hear about it. So I, it could be in an email that I just haven't had a chance to look at yet today, but certainly I can look further into that. Brandon, did you say Wayne County is in Richmond, Indiana? Yes, Wayne County. Yep, okay. We'll look into that and we'll get you and, and follow up tomorrow so everyone else knows. McDonald's is also near and dear to my heart. Go ahead. <laughs> Rob Burgess, the Wabash Plain Dealer. Hello, Rob. Good afternoon. Hello, Governor. Thank you again for doing this. I always appreciate it. Um, we had our uh, first COVID-19 death uh, in Wabash County reported yesterday, and I wanted to follow up on the addition of the presumptive positive deaths uh, mm. that Dr. Box spoke about earlier. Are actual samples being taken from the patients who died? Um, how can you be certain of the accuracy of, of those numbers after the fact? Um, and thank you, Governor. I will ask the <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Crouch a question since uh, that'll help me write my story for tomorrow. Uh, that's great news you delivered. Uh, can you tell me why North Manchester specifically was selected as one of the grant recipients? So uh, North Manchester, let me look here real quick because we just put out the uh, we just put out the announcement, and I will tell you exactly on North Manchester. If you bear with me one minute here. The town of North Manchester actually received $250,000 to build upon the existing revolving loan fund to provide grants to local businesses with employees who have low and moderate income households impacted by the current COVID-19 crisis. So that was a grant to those businesses that are helping to retain jobs there in North Manchester. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. You're so welcome. So the second part of your question, or first part, um, with regards to presumptive COVID deaths, first of all, we rely very heavily on the diagnoses that are put on a death certificate, uh, especially when someone dies, obviously, in the hospital or a long-term care facility by the provider, so by the physician or the advanced practice nurse that's actually putting down the cause of death on there. 
as I've mentioned, the COVID-19 has a very classic look on a CT scan of the chest, on the chest X-ray, and that clinical picture. So we, we would look at whether the individual physician or practitioner said that that was the cause of death, and that's why we're pulling that. I don't want people to feel, I think we're going to post this on Friday, but there's not hundreds of these deaths. I don't want you to think that there's a very large number here, but I, I just want to prepare you that we will see an increase and, and it will not be even 100, although any deaths are, are a tremendous number. Nikki Kelly, the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Good afternoon, Nikki. Hi, Governor. Um, I kind of want to follow up on a few things that different reporters have said. We mentioned the 6,300 te tests that we're not near to yet. And also, I wanted to find out, has the test, I mean, has the state actually purchased any tests? And if so, how many? And then also, your guidance online still says to only test symptomatic people in small categories. So why have you not issued new guidance to test everyone who has symptoms? So we can make that more clear on our, on our uh, website if you'd like, but it also says very clearly there that we want practitioners to use their clinical judgment. So if those individuals feel that this, ind this patient has COVID-19, we want them to test. But you're right, we could probably put that in, in big block letters and we will do that. I think that's a very good point. Um, the 6,300, again, purchase tests. Well, tests are um, provided in the form of swabs and viral transport media. So we, we have um, had Lilly making that, a subsidiary of Cook has been making that, and the swabs have been the biggest issue. Um, as you know, I had some swabs donated, but I also have been working uh, with FEMA to get more swabs. We've been buying through our State Department of Health lab, um, and, and many of our hospitals around the state are provided some swabs, so they've been using what they have, but that's been in, in very short supply. Yeah, okay, just clarify. I'm have sorry? Have bought swabs and tests, and if so, how many and how much is it? So, yes, we have tried to buy swabs, but do I know how many swabs we have bought directly? I, I cannot tell you, because again, the, the federal government has taken over the supply of a lot of this. It's not a question of money. I have plenty of money. If I can find them, I buy them and will buy them. Nikki, if you can um, hold that question, we will have an update tomorrow on PPE, including the two items that you talked about. Justin Keel, the Westville Indicator. Good afternoon, Justin. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you for taking our questions. The state of Ohio has tested every inmate in three of its correctional facilities. It discloses how many tests were conducted at each facility and recently found that 76% of all inmates at one particular prison had tested positive. The Indiana Department of Corrections has declined to share the same information. Governor, when might we expect to see the full prison testing numbers released? And would you consider directing the Department of Corrections to disclose the number of COVID-19 tests it is conducting in each correctional facility so that policy. communities with prisons whose hospitals could be impacted by outbreaks in those prisons will understand the scale of outbreaks and the state's efforts to contain them. Yeah, Dr. Doss, you wanna talk about our policy? Sure. Um, Dr. Doss, Chief Medical Officer for Indiana Department of Correction, and thank you for the question. Um, we are currently in the process of updating our website as we speak. So if you go try to check our numbers right now, it's probably down because we are trying to be as transparent as possible. Um, and like the governor mentioned, to put all the facts out on the table to get you all the information that you need. Um, in fact, we have um, looked at the information Ohio has put out and are um, using a very similar format to get information out to all Hoosiers. Um, as far as um, the testing and um, whatnot from the local perspective, we have a daily phone call with the hospitals up in the Westville area, um, around Michigan City in that area, to talk to not only the hospital stakeholders, but EMS, um, local officials, um, any person in that area, government official who wants to be a part of that call, please email me. We will make sure that they have all the information in real time, high level daily briefing directly from the Department of Correction. Thank you. Abdul Hakeem Shabazz, Indy Politics. Good afternoon, Abdul. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Dr. Box. Uh, always good to make my daily 2.30 appointment uh, with you folks. 
<laughs> uh, Governor, a uh, couple things. I think one for you, one for the Lieutenant Governor, actually. Uh, does Indiana have any uh, intention to participate uh, in the work shares program of the CARES Act uh, that would allow, uh, well, the, I think the way it works is yep. uh, employees would reduce some of their hours, but then pick up some of the federal money. I know you folks have been working on a number of different things. So number one, is there any plan anytime soon for you to make a decision on whether Indiana will participate in the CARES Act? And for the Lieutenant Governor, uh, we've been hearing lots of stories around the country about you know, farmers that can't sell their product, but also food banks you know, in urban areas uh, going empty. Is there any state effort to coordinate you know, farmers with their product with maybe food banks here you know, in urban areas where people need uh, the help or the assistance? Uh, we are looking at the work shares, and Fred has taken the podium, so I'll uh, yield uh, to you, Fred. Okay. We are looking at uh, the work share program. There are a variety of uh, data points that we have to look at uh, while making that decision. So, but to directly answer your question, we are looking at that. Uh, and but we are trying to make sure that we're prioritizing um, all of the things under the CARES Act that we have to roll out first. So we'll be back to you on that. And Abdul, thank you. Uh, I mentioned in my comments that one of the initiatives that Indiana Grown Department has undertaken is is identifying those farmers uh, with produce and then connecting them to food banks and to food pantries. So. We are currently working on that and undertaking that effort, uh, but we'll continue to explore ways that we can uh, help connect our farmers that have ready product and produce and be able to find those markets for them. So thank you. Dominic Miranda, WTHI News 10. Afternoon, Dominic. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Dr. Box. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I think this question would be for Dr. Box. Um, uh, two questions. A lot of comparison has been made between COVID-19 and the flu, uh, but you've both continually given numbers to show that this virus is obviously much more severe than the run-of-the-mill flu. Many who are protesting to reopen the economy have made these comparisons to the flu and downplay the seriousness of COVID-19. I guess my question would be, what uh, would you say to these comparisons? And then stemming off of that, the director of the CDC said in an interview that the second wave of COVID-19 coupled with flu season could be even more difficult than this wave. Uh, how big of a concern is that at this point? Two excellent questions. Um, first of all, I think that I said, and I don't, I don't know if I remember the number totally accurately, but I think that we average about 154 flu deaths in a seven month period of time. For, so over our flu season per year, we have had years that have been higher, um, but we have already had many, many more deaths than that here in the state of Indiana in just this short period of time, you know, this short six to seven week period of time. So I don't think there is any comparison. I mean, there is no, herd immunity to COVID-19. When this hit our population, we hadn't had this before. So there weren't people out there that even if we got a new influenza strain, might get a little sick, might get a high temperature, have to stay home. But, and also there, were no one, there was no one that had been vaccinated against this. So, so even though it is a similar virus in that you get muscle aches and you get fever and you can have the upper respiratory and lower respiratory infection, and even though it does hit, similar populations like our immune suppressed and our elderly and and other individuals that are at higher risk this is a totally different animal that we're dealing with here this virus is much more lethal and we have seen that already in our state so making those comparisons just it just doesn't equate in my mind yeah and and i would just say in two words not close i mean you're you're exactly right you said the average over a five-year period is 154. Um, for some reason, I think it was 118 flu uh, in 2017 to 2018. We're at deaths. That's just deaths, and you elaborated on that and all that it means with hospitalizations. Um, but we're at 661 deaths, 118 versus 661, and that's on top of the flu. And there is no vaccine. You're not going in and getting a shot and having the confidence that you can go back to work. And so in terms of antibiotics and treatment and vaccines, different, as she said, different animal. And that's the extent of my medical knowledge. Yeah. Sam Quinn, Indianapolis Business Journal. Good afternoon, Sam. Hello. I 
want to go back to um, the testing. It sounds like the swabs, uh, getting our hands on those, have been the most challenging in meeting that testing capacity. But are there still people in Indiana today who need a test for this and aren't getting in one for whatever reason because there's a lack of equipment or something else? Yes, I, I still hear from people. I mean, people know my emails posted and I still hear from them. I hear things like, you know, I was very sick and I had a high fever and I had a chest X-ray and I went to the ER, it showed that I have pneumonia and I didn't get tested. And I think because sometimes we think that the clinical picture, we don't, it doesn't make a difference in how we're going to treat this particular individual, sometimes we don't test. And the problem is that when we don't test, then I don't have that positive test to follow up on from a contact tracing and, and making sure that we find out where that individual's been and who's been in contact with them. Do they work in a long-term care facility? Do they work with immunosuppressed individuals? Do they have someone in their home that is at risk? So it, it really does make a difference. I, I, I do hear from individuals intermittently still. So I, I know it's a problem, I believe it, and we're working very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. Elizabeth, PBS, Michiana. Hello, Elizabeth. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you for taking my question and for these daily updates. Governor, in addition to the 16 calls you've been part of with the National Governors Association, you are part of a bipartisan group of governors who are working in close coordination to open the Midwest regional economy. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that coordination entails and how it will shape your decisions for the state of Indiana. Well, um, you use the word coordination. I would also add it's about collaboration, cooperation. It's about knowing what each other's doing, what the right hand and the left hand are doing, or the left hand and the right hand are doing, depending on which border you're looking toward, uh, and north and south. And so because we share borders and travel, uh, because folks work maybe across the border, it's very important that we know at what stage we're all thinking and, and acting. And so when you have uh, companies like we do um, that are attracting folks in and, and out, whether they live or work or play or um, uh, the reasons why they're crossing the borders, then it's very important that we know what each other's doing. And that's what that um, regional cooperation is all about and we've extended that to you know the the coalition that I'm part of is kind of like the Great Lakes but I'm on a daily I'll be on the phone with the governor of Ohio after this um, I'll be on the phone with the governor of Ohio and Kentucky Friday morning um, and so there are ongoing very regular conversations not just about what our case level is uh, hospital rate, you know, all the numbers that we're looking at that you hear Dr. Box report on every single day, but then what are we thinking in terms of, um, you know, long-term, short-term, um, opening up, how we would consider doing that. Obviously, I didn't want, I wanted them to know that we were um, looking to open up on our elective procedures um, as we go forward over the next couple weeks. Um, they're thinking about the same things when you talk about retail and curbside service, et cetera. So it's just, it's more of a open dialogue an ongoing real time conversation, uh, between us as governors. Whitney Downard, CNHI. Hello, Whitney. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My question is kind of specifically about that federal bill that's just passed the Senate last night, it's on its way to the House. One of the specific provisions is $25 billion for states testing. to ramp up their testing so long as they provide a plan. What are we doing now to kind of start putting together that plan and what are some aspects that need to be included in order for us to get this funding? Obviously, the, the parameters are still under discussion, but what are we doing now to make sure we prepare to get that funding? So, okay. So, so we are, as I, as I mentioned, I am working with the Indiana Hospital Association. I'm working with our local public health, so um, our local health departments and labs all across the state. Um, 
yesterday, um, today, and through the end of the week, talking about who's doing testing, how much testing they can do, what are their barriers to being able to do this test, and where can we actually make sure that we can actually have individuals that are stationed to do testing pretty much eight in the morning to eight at night, so that individuals that need to be tested know in their community where they can go to get this testing done. And a big part of that is, is bringing all of that those services together, mapping that out, and then coming up with that plan of how we are going to make sure that this is sustainable through this time next year, so that this is available. And then Indiana will be ready and prepared to accept funds to help us to make sure that this happens. That'll include PPE, it'll include testing supplies, it'll include personnel to be able to man these, and the cooperation of individuals all over the state. Jacqueline Ryan, Stark County Leader. Good afternoon, thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, thank you for taking my questions. I have a few today, um, but I'll make them quick. Um, one is specifically for Lieutenant Governor Crouch um, about the COVID-19 response program. I know that many communities are probably applying for the full 250,000. So um, what, what is going into the decision making process about um, where those funds are being allocated? And then my second question is just um, specifically about, you know, um, this is in the future, but uh, as organizers are trying to make adjustments to events. Um, when can they expect to get some guidance from the state as far as what's going to be allowed for gatherings? Like even if this is in June or July, um, will there be any kind of specific information um, provided in the near future to kind of give them some guidance? Yes. You. Lieutenant Governor, you want to take the first one and I can take the second one? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for the question. Uh, there's a team at the Office of Community and Rural Affairs, and as the applications come in, they look at the need, they look at the request, and they look at where it is in the state. So they try to have a balanced approach. Uh, we have awarded almost two million of the four and a half million, but we also are anticipating an additional $18 million for COVID response through those community development block grant funds uh, through the CARES Act. So we're going to have even more resources to help communities address their needs here during this time period and during this crisis. Uh, so I hope that that answers your question, but uh, there will be more to come. Thank you. Yeah, and I would, I would say, you know, this is, um, I asked for, sent out uh, a solicitation actually to various sectors, industries, about 17 of them, you know, the manufacturers, chambers of commerce, um, retailers, construction, uh, hospitality industry, hotels, restaurants, tourism, uh, which includes big events, obviously festivals and parades, et cetera. Asked for all that information by close of business today. I guess that's relative when you say close of business in the, in the world we're living in uh, right now. Um, but we've asked to get that information from those various sectors by the close of business today. And then that will help us inform uh, those steps going forward come May 1, when we um, look to update our executive order. Kayla Sullivan, Fox 59. Hello, Kayla, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. And I love that you said your goal is transparency. It is music to my journalist ears. So on that note, I'd like to continue pursuing transparency on nursing home cases as other states list the nursing homes with positive COVID-19 cases and families say they can't get information about their nursing homes. Why won't the state identify the nursing homes where COVID has infected residents, especially since the spokesperson for long-term care says there are no HIPAA violations and she recommends naming the nursing homes without naming specific residents? You look like you both want to well, say something. <laughs> Well, Dan, you stay there, but I, I want to start real quick. So I, I want to say that I absolutely respect the need for families and contacts of individuals, whoever's been listed as that contact, that family member for an individual in a long-term care facility or a residential facility, that they have the right to know what's going on in that facility. I 100% 100 respect the transparency and the knowledge and, and information that needs to be shared. 
And so we are working very hard to make sure that that occurs for every single residence, family, or contact individual. And I'm gonna let Dr. Dan address how we're working to, to do that. Yeah, thank you. So I would echo that as well. And I will say as a clinician, when I think about the communication piece, it's really with families that I think it's the most important because those families may me need to make difficult decisions. They may decide whether or not they want to take their loved one out of the facility. They want to facilitate better communications or even have discussions with them about what that family member would want if they developed COVID-19. So as part of that and building upon what we've already done uh, along with our checklist and our CDC guidance is we're partnering with the director of the ombudsman program. So we're going to work with her and by the end of this week have a plan that we will be able to share with all of the long-term care facilities about best practices and guidance for updating uh, that a resident representative and their families about a change in COVID status. So we'll be working with them with the hope that we will have that rolled out next week. Then as we hear, and if we hear that there are families who are not being informed about cases, we will go back with our uh, regional ombudsman office, investigate those, look into those, and make sure that all the long-term care facilities are doing what really is clinically a best practice, which is communicating to the family about the change in that facility. So those long-term facilities are in touch with us on those cases on a daily basis mm -hmm. and should be with the families. The families. Yeah. That's right. Michael WBEZ. Hello, Michael. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you for taking my question. Well, Governor, today I'm reporting on problems at meat packaging plants in Chicago. I'm wondering on the Indiana side, uh, how is Indiana making sure safeguards are put, being put in place at Indiana meat packaging plants and farms to make sure workers are safe? And my second question is, you know, California is making farm workers eligible for some stimulus money. Will Indiana do the same for these very essential workers? You want to, you've been knee deep sure. in this. <laughs> We, we have been working um, with meatpacking plants and um, facilities around the state already because there is a lot of um, very close activity and congregate activity there. Some of them even live during the week together. And so there certainly have been a significant number of cases in some facilities. So our strike team goes in there just like they would in a prison, a jail, or a long-term care facility. We have worked um, to make sure that um, factories and facilities are separating into individuals from a social distancing standpoint or putting up barriers, making sure that they are deep cleaning and testing and then retesting, going back and retesting additional uh, individuals that are working in those facilities. We're keeping in contact not only with hospitals in that area, but also with the local health department along with the particular facility and in some cases the, the um, county commissioners. And we'll continue to work with our federal partners um, as progress is made. We're constantly advocating. You saw some recent announcements from Secretary Purdue uh, of Ag uh, in Washington, D.C., working with them to make sure that uh, our farming community, our agricultural community is included in these discussions in terms of um, making sure that they can get, you know, that, that they have a bridge as well to the other side. Tom Davies, The Associated Press. Afternoon, Tom. Hello, Governor. Uh, could you or Dr. Box give details on how uh, contact tracing has been done so far and how that fits in your plan for reopening? And then how soon do you think, as you consider the reopening process, that the state might be able to enter into the phase two of reopening that the White House has described? So I'll part. talk a little bit about the contact tracing. Most of the, we have as a state at the State Department of Health assisted many of our local health departments in contact tracing. Many of our local health departments have basically gathered everybody that they can from their health department and have been identifying as these positive cases come through those individuals, uh, calling them finding out based on their history where they work, where they, ha where they live, who they've been in close contact with, and then have been identifying those contacts. They have been working very hard to make sure that those individuals that are positive understand what isolation means and, and how they need to isolate themselves even within their own home from their family. That involves a separate bedroom usually, a separate bathroom, and food that's left outside the door and you knock on the door and leave and then they open the door and get their food. It, it's, it's 
it's, there's a lot of really good communication, I'm sorry, that we can give. Along with that, when we call individuals then that are contacts, we have to explain to them that they've been in close contact with someone that has COVID-19 and what they need to do and the signs and symptoms they need to look for, and then make sure that they have a way to follow up with us if they develop signs or symptoms so that they too can be tested. Hopefully there won't be a lot of contacts with them because if they've been quarantining at home, then they will not have people, except maybe their immediate people, uh, family living with them that would be at risk. So that's an incredibly important part of being being able to open up so that we can track these cases down as quickly as possible and then we can make sure that those individuals isolate and any individuals that have been in close contact quarantine. It is a, a very difficult process. It's become very large with the numbers of cases that we have and so State Department of Health has been investigating and doing a lot of the contact tracing to help. Some local health departments have been able to manage this completely. Some have done an amazing job and then all of a sudden have an outbreak in a, a meat packing plant or in some other area that they ask for help with that and we will continue that it's going to require hiring additional call center type help to be doing some of this investigation for us extremely Tom just to answer your second part of your question and and just to repeat really what dr. box said very labor-intensive obviously we got these local health departments in all the different counties but people are traveling inside and outside of counties traveling all over the you know the state to maybe go to work you know essential business and so uh, we will be ramping that effort up it will be critically important it's part of our equation um, as we monitor where those numbers are like I said earlier testing tracing isolation making sure so that we're keeping our numbers down and our PPE isn't threatened that we have the personnel to be able to deliver the care uh, for the folks that um, are not just seeking it but need it and every step of the way whether it's next Monday or 14 Mondays from now uh, this could be and will be a critically important part of that whole formula uh, to get you know back into that new normal routine way of life. Thank you for joining today's press conference. Governor Holcomb's next briefing will be tomorrow. At and you've been watching Governor Eric Holcomb's update on Indiana's coronavirus response. As you heard Dr. Box say, 31 additional deaths were added to Indiana's total, bringing it to 661. Uh, worth noting that there has been a technical glitch with reporting cases to the state. Again, we talked about that yesterday. That does continue, uh, Dr. Box saying, that that has been resolved, so they are expecting those numbers to go up later this week. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch appearing in the briefing saying that uh, 13 communities have been awarded $2 million in grants for additional testing. Testing the big subject in today's briefing, uh, the uh, Christina Box talking about doctors needing to be able to test patients who are sick and that uh, testing can ramp up in Indiana. They do have the labs available. There's no issue there, but there is issues still with equipment. That may be a barrier. Also getting patients to areas that are equipped to do testing. Again, that would be the next phase of testing, which would allow people to uh, go back to work. We'll have much more on all these developments tonight on CBS 4 News at 5 and 6 and right now on the CBS 4 Indy News app. For now, let's return to your local broadcast.